So I'm going to be talking to you today on tobacco, on bridges, and global warming as examples of how individual people, as well as governments, as well as politicians, are on the precipice of disaster for the same underlying reason. That the decisions that are made and the reward structures that um, attend those decisions focus almost entirely on the short term, but what we need today in this world is more long-term decisions to be made. So let's start with smoking. Smoking is dangerous. Uh, you don't have to smoke uh, that much to know that it's dangerous. Uh, there's some quick facts on smoking uh, from many. Um, even though there have been tremendous public health successes in Canada, in the United States, and throughout most high-income countries for smoking rates going down, it's still the case today that 4.5 million Canadians smoke and about 37,000 Canadians die every year of smoking-related causes. By far the number one preventable cause of death and disease in Canada as well as most countries throughout the world. In the United States, it's about 44 million Americans smoke and close to half a million will die this year. Really distressing fact is that one half of regular smokers will die of a smoking-related disease. And for those that die, who die, they will lose well over a decade of life. About 90% Canadians and uh, American smokers actually say in our uh, ITC project uh, work that if I had to do it over again, I would not have started smoking. And in fact, the vast majority of smokers in Canada, US, and most countries throughout the world do not want to be smoking. So you have a situation here where this very deadly um, behavior uh, and is known um, by most people to be very dangerous to themselves and to others. These are behaviors that, despite the fact that they know all that, they continue to do it. Well, there are many reasons for this. Why would this be? Well, uh, clearly uh, many reasons for smoking, but at the very core of it, no matter what, it's the case that cigarettes are highly addictive. In fact, from the warning label of Canadian uh, cigarette packs um, uh, until the recent ones came on, studies have shown that tobacco can be harder to quit than heroin or cocaine. Th it's this addictive property that the tobacco industry has known for for over uh, decades before they were willing to admit it, forced to admit it in public, and in fact they enhanced it. They found ways of making the, the, the nicotine in the cigarette more addictive, using things like adding ammonia, other kinds of uh, design um, attributes uh, of cigarettes. They have capitalized on the fact that it's uh, addictive and, and all of us are the worse for it. Um, so. But what I want to do is I want to take you to what I would call a decision process of the smoker. And I don't mean that um, a smoker decides this consciously every time, but there are choice points uh, for a smoker deciding whether to smoke the next cigarette. Uh, and I, what I want to do is I want to present a little chart here where the y-axis, the vertical axis, is overall well-being, uh, and on the x-axis is in time in seconds or minutes. So. As the smoker, uh, after the last cigarette, the smoker in, uh, starts experiencing withdrawal symptoms after a while. Uh, and you can sort of uh, depict this as a downward trend in overall well-being. So here's the choice point. Should I smoke this next cigarette? And again, it's not the case that they're always making a conscious choice. Oftentimes, smoker, smokers just automatically uh, go for the next cigarette and so on. But nonetheless, this is a choice point whether or not it's a conscious choice. Right? So what are the aspects of this uh, decision point? Well, uh, if the smoker decides not to smoke that next cigarette, then overall well-being will uh, go down continually because uh, withdrawal is going to increase. But if the smoker decides uh, to smoke that next cigarette, then there are benefits. There are benefits um, that accrue from that because the well -being, uh, overall well-being will be uh, brought back up to its, uh, close to its original level. Now, in this decision deciding whether to smoke or not, there are benefits of not smoking, health effects, financial effects, over probably $4,000 a year for the pack-a-day pack -a smoker. 
Uh, there are costs of not smoking, which are continued and increasing withdrawal symptoms. But the important thing here is that the benefits are in the long term, and the costs of not smoking are in the short term. People are very sensitive to short-term outcomes, and in fact, people tend to discount the value of future outcomes. In other words, they are, to use the phrase of behavioral economists, they are myopic. They're only looking certain uh, distance in front of them. They're short-sighted with respect to time. So therefore, if you have benefits in the long term, they're going to be discounted in value. They're going to be weighted less than those short-term consequences. Therefore, the smoker is much more likely to smoke that next cigarette. Okay, so the smoker goes through this maybe 15 to 18 times a day. Uh, that's what it is in Canada uh, and throughout the uh, world, maybe 12, maybe 20 times. But nonetheless, if when we look at the time in hours, then you find this up and down with respect to well-being, all these choice points in favor of continued smoking. But now let's look at days. The same thing happens with days, right? But note that there's no discernible change in the overall well-being because we're still talking about days. But now when we take it to years, that's where we start seeing problems. Because what happens is all those tiny little decisions that are made, going in the short term, myopically saying, hey, I'd much rather smoke than not smoke because I don't want to in, um, incur um, greater withdrawal symptoms, that's all being driven uh, over and over again by this micro decision in the short term, favoring continued smoking. But then, over the years, health may start to decline. After all, I said that for 50% of regular smokers, they die of a smoking-related disease. But nonetheless, all along in the short, and in, in myopically just looking ahead of them, they're still making the same right decision for that moment, even though they're declining. And then finally, for, again, 50% of individuals, they die of a smoking-related disease, all the while making the right choice, right choice, if only looking in the short term, not in the long term. So all of these micro decisions that are heavily biased in favor of the short term smoking parlay themselves into death. And it does. This is a new warning label on the uh, packs of Canadian cigarettes. This is Barb Tarbox, who to her dying day uh, continued to smoke cigarettes because she was so addicted um, and this is just a few days before she died. Note here the cigarette in her hand. Let me now turn to bridges. The 35W Bridge in Minneapolis. On August 1st, 2007, the 35W Bridge collapsed. At rush hour, it's remarkable that only 13, only, 13 people died, uh, over 50 were injured, it could have been much, much worse. It was a predictable tragedy, however. The year before the collapse in 2006, it was acknowledged by the Department of Transportation in Minnesota that the 35W bridge was structurally deficient. It, uh, at that time, in 2006, they estimated it would take $15 million to repair the 35W bridge, plus eight others with that same money. Did they do that? No, they didn't. In fact, the Department of Transportation said, that's a budget buster, and we're not going to spend money on it. The new bridge, after the collapse, costs $235 million. So what an extraordinary example of a short-term decision based on prevention of some tragedy that might happen in the future happening, that tragedy happening, to the detriment of those lives, the, uh, the lives um, destroyed, um, and also, of course, the economic expense. The sad state of bridges, you multiply this by all the bridges in North America, and it's a very sad state indeed. In the United States alone, there are 72,000 structurally deficient bridges, of which 8,000 are fracture critical, which means that if one part of it falls, the whole thing collapses. Now, in some cities, in Pittsburgh, 30% of bridges are known to be structurally deficient. 4.9 million people pass on those bridges every day. In San Francisco, 21% of the bridges are 
uh, structurally deficient, 15.6 million people pass over those bridges every day. Same all over North America. Um, and in fact, if you look at some uh, discussions about bridge maintenance, you find all kinds of quotations. This is just one on focusing on the short term. It's all too easy to put off maintenance until next year so that you can spend the money elsewhere this year. The so to give you some idea of how far short they are um, spending money in, in the United States on bridges, in 2009, the estimated cost of bridge maintenance was about $70.9 billion. How much did they actually spend? $5.2 billion. Tragedies in the making due to the focus on short-term, not long-term consequences. Okay. So let's go to global warming. What will it take to fend off global warming? A lot of estimates there. Uh, here's one from the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2008. He said, the global investments of 15 to 20 trillion dollars over the next 20 to 25 years may be necessary to uh, put the world on a course of sustainable uh, energy. So that's just one estimate. A lot of money, but it has to be done in the relatively short term to fend off the consequences of global warming climate change. Well, imagine the plight of a politician or government deciding whether to spend these billions and trillions of dollars now on infrastructure measures to reduce climate change. Okay, I'm throwing in bridges here also. The potential benefits, the public good is that bridges are safer, global warming would be slowed. Prevention of cataclysmic consequences, uh, savings, uh, economic savings, repair versus rebuilding. It's always easier to repair than to rebuild. Less geographic displacement throughout the world due to rising, um, rising shorelines and so on, rising oceans. On the cost side, enormous economic costs to try to do something about this now. Budgetary constraints, of course. Uh, political costs as well. Now, again, with respect to the smoking uh, uh, situation, all of the, virtually all of these benefits are in the long term, and all the costs are in the short term. A disturbing situation. Who can do the right thing? Imagine the plight of the politician trying to decide whether to spend these billions of dollars now. So on the y-axis, instead of overall well-being, I guess for a politician it would be overall political standing, calculus, whatever. Okay, so let's say a politician is trying to decide whether to do this. Now, the benefits will be in the long term, slowly, but the costs are borne right now. That's a terrible situation because in a democracy, what do we have? We have an election cycle that's in very short time slices. So look, in this example here, all the costs are borne within an electoral cycle. None of the benefits are there. What's the politician going to do? Everything is geared toward the short term, not toward the long term. And in fact, what I would suggest is that there are political democratic systems, to be sure, not the only ones, but let's talk about democracy right now, are inherently focused on short term thinking. How do I say that? The electoral cycle of the United States and the House of Representatives, they're elected every two years. Okay, there's a, a common saying that the first day for a, a representative to take office is the first day that he or she starts running for re-election. In the Senate, it's every six years, president every four or every eight years. That is not enough time to spend the money that is necessary. So. We have been, we've heard about uh, uh, critical observations about democracy from Karl Marx, uh, Eisenhower's take on Marx's uh, perspective that democracy, capitalism, carries within itself the seeds of its own destruction. Okay, very popular phrase. I want to pose the question here, are we living now in an era where the political structure of governments and their reward systems focus so singularly on the short term are at odds with human welfare. So let's go back and revisit this critical observation about democracy, which said that, oh, democracy has the seeds of its own destruction. I would submit that given the reward structures all geared toward the short term, it's not the, democracy is not the seeds of its own destruction. Rather, oops, 
it has the seeds of our destruction. How do we get out of the short-term trap? Well, Michael Bloomberg, mayor of New York City, is an example of someone who has risen above this. He's a wealthy businessman. He's 11th or 12th richest person in the world. Political uh, party, he's been a Democrat, he's been a Republican, now he's an independent, he's now in his third term of office. He is not beholden to special interests because he's independently wealthy, but not only is he independently wealthy, he understands about prevention and about the common good because he has implemented extraordinary health uh, policies in New York City itself. Here are some of them that could never have been done for someone who was beholden to special interests and not thinking about the long term. He has been thinking about the long term and has put action uh, behind his words. Recognition of the problem is an important step, but mobilizing efforts to deal with the problem is another. And I'm very um, thankful that there's this uh, Oxford Martin Commission for Future Generations that is gathering um, individuals, mobilizing for thinking about how to get out of the short-term trap. So the question I want to leave you with is in the future, the smoker deciding whether to smoke the next cigarette, focusing on the short term to the exclusion or near exclusion of the long term, is this same fate that awaits us with governments deciding whether to invest in long term action to avert the consequences of global warming? And it's this depressing possibility that leads me to have given this talk on edge as precipice. Thank you.